They're the people that you meet when you're walking down the street. This is a, a short introduction to some of the people you might meet as you move through the ordination process specifically. So uh, if you are beginning the process of spiritual discernment, it is perfectly fine. And in fact, probably a good idea for you not to be sure whether you're called to ordination or not. And at the beginning of the process, you're gonna meet a lot of folks, lay and ordained bishops, myself, deacons and priests of the diocese who have volunteered their time to work with those of us in the diocese that are seeking a deeper clarity about God's will and purpose in our lives and what we're called to do and to be. And so initially you're gonna meet folks who are volunteering their time to help guide and ask interesting questions. If you're called to ordination, you will also then formally meet with some folks that are on what's called the Commission on Ministry. The Commission on Ministry is a group of people that, are, um, that exist to help advise the bishop on those who are uh, called to lay and ordain ministry. And the Commission on Ministry is the group in the diocese that is um, guided by the canons of our church in order to provide a robust system of formation and training for lay people and ordained deacons and priests in the diocese. And so you'll probably meet with folks from the Commission on Ministry, whether lay ministry is your focus or whether you're called to be a deacon or a priest. If you're called to be a deacon or a priest, you will begin a process of formal formation. You may also do some additional formation if you're called to lay ministry, but if you're called to be a deacon or a priest, that formation will be guided by me as your bishop, um, and we will work together on what does your formation need to include and how will it work, and that formation process will have some evaluative components as well. So there are some standards that we all need to meet based on what we're required to know um, based on what the canons say we're required to know. You might be wondering, what do the canons say that we're required to know? The canons of the Episcopal Church say that in order to be eligible for ordination, deacons need to show competence in five areas. Uh, academic studies, which include holy scriptures, theology, and the tradition of the church the particular theology of the diaconate, human awareness and understanding, spiritual development and discipline, as well as practical training and experience in ministry. In addition, the canons say that those who wish to be ordained as priests must demonstrate proficiency in Holy Scripture, church history, Christian theology, Christian ethics and moral theology, including environmental ethics and theology, Christian worship according to the use of the Book of Common Prayer, the hymnal, and other authorized texts in the Episcopal Church, and the practice of ministry in contemporary society, including leadership, evangelism, stewardship, ecumenism, interfaith relations, mission theology, environmental stewardship and care of creation, the history and contemporary experience of racial and minority groups. And all ordained ministers must also do some practical things, including prevention of sexual misconduct, training, uh, abuse reporting requirements, familiarity with the constitution and canons of the church, especially Title IV, and anti-racism training. And so the Commission on Ministry exists to help advise the bishop as you work through your process of formation for the diaconate or the priesthood, and you'll meet with them regularly throughout your time of formation. You will also meet, as you go through, uh, teachers. These may be professors at a three-year residential seminary that you either attend in person for three years or you attend uh, occasionally as a part of a non-residential or low residence program. They may also be faculty of the Bishop's School for Ministry uh, that you will meet as you go through that process as well. Those 
formal teachers will actually be involved in your assessment to make sure that you're academically learning what needs to be learned. But they're not the only folks to contribute to that because it's not just your head that we're working on. We're forming a whole life for ordained ministry. And so there will also be mentors and supervisors and rectors and um, colleagues that you are in a cohort group with. And they'll all be feeding information about how you're doing and how you're growing and what um, and, and where you're thriving and where you're struggling. All of that gets fed into the Commission on Ministry and ultimately to the bishop, as it is my job to help guide your process of formation to make sure that if you're called to be a deacon or a priest, that by the time you're ordained deacon or priest, you're ready to go with all of the formation that's necessary to start. And so um, we will work with you on that. So you'll meet members of the Commission on Ministry. You'll meet teachers and mentors and guides along the way. People who facilitate the cohort will, uh, will have you work with Dr. Janine Driscoll, who works on group processes and is also, uh, she's a clinical therapist as well as a priest of the church. And she has a, will do, is a really, really good person to ask about the spiritual demands of an ordained life. You will also meet members of the standing committee. The standing committee is uh, elected. They are a group that partners with the bishop to help govern the diocese of the Rio Grande. The standing committee is the council of advice for the bishop, but they also have their own responsibility under the canons of the church to vote yes or no. Are you ready to be ordained deacon or priest in the church? And that is to prevent the bishop from just ordaining whoever the bishop wants to ordain. <laughs> we are all ordained to serve the wider church. And both the Commission on Ministry and the Standing Committee represent the wider church um, so that the bishop and the Standing Committee must concur uh, if you're going to be ordained. Finally, I'll just talk a little bit about my role as bishop over the process. I am entrusted with the responsibility of ordaining priests and deacons, and to help in the ordination of fellow bishops. That responsibility is entrusted to bishops because we are called to stand in the line of the apostles, going back to the 12 that were sent out in, by Jesus himself to go throughout the world and proclaim the good news of the gospel to heal the sick and uh, feed the hungry and visit those in prison. So the church has been governed by bishops for centuries, and it is the role of the bishop to actually do the laying on of hands uh, for all those that are called to the diaconate and the priesthood. When I was called to be the bishop of the Diocese of the Rio Grande, they gave me a number. I'm bishop number 1,110. That's the 1,110th bishop of the Episcopal Church. And it takes three bishops at least to ordain a bishop. And so there is a book that is right over there in, in my office where it has my name and my, my little number, and then next to it, three columns that list the numbers of those bishops who laid their hands on me in order to make me a bishop. And each of those numbers, you can find their number and who they are and who ordained them, and thus trace the lineage of bishop ordinations all the way back to bishop number one, and that was Samuel Seabury who was the first bishop ordained on American soil in the Anglican tradition after the Revolutionary War. Bishop Seabury was ordained by three bishops in Scotland, and each of them can trace their lineage back to the first bishop, uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury, who was sent to Canterbury by Pope Gregory the Great. And of course, Augustine can trace his lineage to Pope Gregory, Pope Gregory can trace the lineage all the way back to Peter and the original 12. So when it comes time for you to be ordained to the diaconate or the priesthood, and I representing the church lay my hands upon you, there's a literal hands on head from your head to Jesus that goes all the way back. And so as a bishop, it's my responsibility to ordain those who are duly selected and formed to serve and then I also hold the vows of all of those ordained uh, in the church. So if you are called to be a deacon or a priest, you will take vows of obedience 
to obey your bishop in the work that is given to you in the church. Obey is not a word we hear often in our culture. Uh, what does it mean for an ordained minister to take vows of obedience to their bishop? Now, obedience isn't so much about following orders as it is about listening. The word obedience comes from the word obed, which means listening to the Holy Spirit as that word is spoken through the church. When we are called to uh, ordination, we are also called to obedience, to listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit through those that are working with us as colleagues, and particularly to our bishop who guides that ministry. So it's actually true that those who are called to ordination have less freedom than lay people do in the church. And if you are called to be a priest, you need permission to work outside the church from your bishop in order to do so, because your primary call and vocation is to serve the church. So if you're called to ordination, it'll be my pleasure as your bishop to hold your vows and to nurture and encourage your vocation to help encourage you when you might be discouraged, when mistakes are made, to help strengthen your ministry, to provide feedback and guidance along the way. And that process starts as you begin your path towards ordination through the formation process. As you go through that formation process, you'll write Ember Day letters to me four times a year in which you'll describe your spiritual formation and how things are going, what's happening in your family, et cetera. And over the course of that journey, you will actually detach from your congregation and the support of your local community. And by the time you're ordained to the diaconate, you will be cared for primarily by me as your chief pastor and by your colleagues in ministry who are ordained people, by your spiritual director and therapist and a network of support folks that you put together. But that'll be a very different group supporting you than your current congregation, which is who's supporting you right now. Trust the smoke, trust the smoke.